Welcome everybody to our Future Tense event on imagining transportation futures with Secretary Pete Buttigieg and some of our talented Future Tense fiction writers. Um, I'm Paul Butler. I'm the President and Chief Transformation Officer here at New America. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background and Future Tense is a project of New America, Arizona State University and Slate Magazine. We explore the impact of technology on society and how we live. And we're so excited today for the conversation. Um, Future Tense publishes ideas journalism on this theme and hosts conversations like this one, all under the tagline, A Citizen's Guide to the Future. A few years ago, in alliance with our partners at ASU Science Center for Science and Imagination, we decided to add speculative fiction to our Citizen's Guide to the Future Toolkit I'm publishing a monthly fiction story and response essay on Slate. Um, our Future Tense fiction editors wrote in the preface to their first published anthology of fiction, and I quote, we hope that Future Tense fiction stories help us imaginatively rehearse possible future scenarios and help us get better at recognizing where things could be different even when they're hard to glimpse. Scientific and technological elites and leaders often present the future as a fait accompli. A good story, though, can help us find a different point of view to scout out the decision points so that we can muster our resources and act at the right moment. Sounds like a lofty goal on the part of my future tense colleagues. And in the real world of Washington policymaking, annual appropriations bills and the like, we ask the question, is there a role to be played by future scenarios derived from our imagination and from our art? Secretary Buttigieg, we're so honored to have you. Thanks for making the time to join us. Thanks very much, Paul. Really, uh, really pleased to be here and uh, uh, really a fan of the work that's going on here. So thanks to New American Future Tense for having me. Thank you. I want to jump right in because we have a great panel that will follow our exchange and conversation. Um, and I would love to start with uh, a question and maybe a thought around um, what happens uh, as ideas get exchanged, what we may describe as in the horizontal. Um, sometimes the most innovative ideas in design and in process are inspired, they're borrowed from other industries. Um, I think about uh, things like food and beauty or music and architecture or automotive and fashion, uh, we often see that kind of exchange across sectors. And I'm wondering, as you do your work um, about thinking and imagination of transportation, are there industries that you borrow from? Um, are there sectors that inspire you? Yeah, what, it's, it's a great place to begin. Um, First of all, let, let me offer a, a reflection, which is it, it's striking how much of our imagination about the future is centered on transportation, at least in terms of the imagery of it, right? You look at uh, how the establishing shot of a, a, a sci-fi show or, or, or film, for example, tells you you're in the future. And, and usually what establishes it is there's different ways people are getting around. There's, there's levitating cars or there's starships or something like that. And so we've always rightly or wrongly, had a disproportionate sense that what tells us we're in the future and not the present or what marks the present as different from the past is, is how we get around. But of course, the, the reality is a lot of the most profound technologies that affect our lives, uh, including, uh, ironically, the most profound technologies that affect transportation itself, aren't necessarily vehicles or what's on board vehicles. So you want to talk about a horizontal translation. One thing to consider is that in the last decade, I would argue the most important piece of transportation technology was not a vehicle, it was the smartphone. I mean, certainly the thing that changed transportation for most of us most tangibly uh, was probably the rise of rideshare companies like Uber and Lyft. Um, they were using the same kind of cars that, that, that taxis used and that we used to get ourselves around. Um, but the way in which we would summon them changed. And through that, a different labor model emerged, a different means of getting around emerged. Um, 
with good things and bad things that came out of it. Um, but it's a reminder of the value of that, that lateral thinking. I think it'll continue to be the case that communications technology will mean as much to transportation as propulsion technology will. Uh, I think increasingly you're seeing automotive companies turning into software companies. Uh, and I think it's never a bad idea to look at uh, uh, fields that uh, aren't even exactly industries as such, like uh, film and literature, to recenter our imagination on why transportation matters in terms of its human impact. Uh, and that's what we try to focus on here at the department too. We deal a lot with, with technology, but try not to get absorbed in tech for tech's sake. We try to think of it in terms of how will the deployment of this technology make everyday life different, make it better or worse from the perspective of safety or equity or economic empowerment. Those are the kinds of questions that should be keeping us busy as policymakers. And uh, that can be touched by any field, but certainly I think the humanities is one that arouses our imagination about what it's like to be somebody different than who we are. Yeah, and I think we, we, we won't get into the policy portion of, of, of that discussion today, which is maybe, a, uh, I think, an interesting place for us to stay. And I'd, I'd love to go back to something you said, uh, which really also provokes me to think about some of those works of fiction. Um, as you said, they open a lot with these great images that, that stick with us. Um, I want to go back there and just as I think about things like the Flintstones, uh, as I think about the Jetsons, the Matrix, Back to the Future, um, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right that, that these images and stories that involve transportation really do create an impression about the future uh, and the present. Um, I'm wondering if you, if you think about you know, your favorite works of fiction that have uh, transportation elements uh, what sticks with you? One, one, tell us what is one of those favorite works that, that made an impression on you, and particularly in the role that you have now? Well, look, I came up on Star Trek, and, and so, uh, which is obviously very much about transportation, right? Uh, from, from the shuttles to the, uh, uh, to, to the, the starships, to the, that, that vision of the transporter that's the uh, first time we see long distance transportation that doesn't involve a vehicle at all. Um, but if you look at where Star Trek was predictive, uh, revealingly, it actually wasn't on the transportation side, right? It was more things like the communication side, the little, especially from the original series in the, in the 60s, they're the little devices that they use uh, now resemble um, cell phones. Um, sensing technology, uh, if you think about a medical tricorder and how that relates to some of the uh, most impressive things happening in life sciences, um, actually more uh, on the nose than, uh, uh, than most of what we saw there from a transportation perspective. Um, I do think it's interesting to think about the, the uh, Jetsons and the Flintstones, right? Both of them, unlike Star Trek with their transporters, uh, have the presumption of the, the conveyance that moves you from, from point A to point B. There's the family car and the Jetsons, it's the flying car, right? In uh, the Flintstones, it's the foot propelled uh, vehicle. Interestingly, we've moved actually in both directions. We've come to realize active transportation isn't a primitive thing. It's a very advanced thing. And, and, and we're doing more with bicycles and, and, and self-propelled transportation in that regard. Haven't quite gotten to flying cars yet, um, but, uh, uh, but we have seen that, that what, what seems to change more than the, um, uh, the, than the uh, uh, you know, fact of the vehicle is its propulsion. Uh, and as we're moving into an electric vehicle future, that's something to think about. But what even the Simpsons didn't, or sorry, the, uh, uh, the Jetsons didn't, we could have a whole other conversation on the Simpsons. Um, what even the Jetsons didn't picture is that, uh, you know, by the time anybody's got a flying car, uh, George Jetson probably doesn't have to drive it. Uh, and, uh, and again, it, it's, it's revealing that sometimes what matters most is uh, uh, something we weren't really thinking about, which is um, uh, how, how we relate to these pieces of transportation technology versus, you know, what they're, physical capabilities, like their speed, for example, actually are. That's uh, so interesting. And you're, you're <laughs> elevating something about you know, these works of fiction and stories and, and time and the compression of time and the elasticity of time, um, which is really fascinating and, 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 and brings me to another, maybe another area of exploration and just reflection. Um, so much of, of the work around transportation has kind of a very present, very real, very now kind of um, 
needs uh, need state. Um, we have to get from point A to point B and solve issues that are with us in the moment. And then on the other hand, the work itself, the output of the work, uh, in many cases, bridges, tunnels, that you know, if we think very fundamentally about it, has such permanence um, and such long duration. Um, and then if you think about flying cars, I mean, we're forecasting way into the future. So we have to solve at these very, you know, kind of binary points or wide points, if you will, of the very present, the very now, and the very far in the future. Uh, how do you think about that? How do you resolve that in your day to day? Yeah. yeah, you've nailed a big question that we think about a lot because a lot of the things we're building, especially with the new law and the, and the funding that we have in the bipartisan infrastructure package, these are the means to build cathedrals of infrastructure. And the nature of a cathedral is that it's, uh, it takes a long time to complete and then it's in service for a very long time. We rely on the cathedrals of infrastructure from past generations, right? We're figuring out what to not just iconic things like uh, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, but uh, we're figuring out what to do about the Baltimore and Potomac tunnels. They're 149 years old, and a lot of people depend on them right now uh, for our passenger rail travel. Just to give you one example. And so we have to make decisions that are a bit of a bet on the future. And at the same time, we don't want to bet the farm on the future turning out one way or the other. So what I spend a lot of time thinking about is how can we deploy our capital in an agile or nimble way so that some of these decisions will make sense even if we don't quite know how commuting patterns are gonna work in seven years, let alone 50. But we know that certain things are gonna be true. We know that you're gonna need bridges to get from uh, one side of a, a physical barrier to another. Uh, we know that we're going to need resources and hubs where people can come together to access modes of transportation, even if those modes evolve. Uh, things like train stations or town squares or transit hubs or airports and ports. So what we've got to do is invest in the things we know we're going to need no matter what, and then create room for other things to happen that might be very difficult to picture. And the best way to do that is to not think about the, the asset first, but to think about the people that it'll affect first and, and to think really big about the effect that your investments are going to have. I'll give you an example around high-speed rail uh, or any really good rail service. You mentioned getting from point A to point B, and part of the appeal is that if I'm going from somewhere, if I, if, if I live in Washington and I'm going to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, uh, I might have the option one day of being able to do it on a faster, uh, sleeker train than I do today. And that's true. But what's really interesting about a new rail service uh, is that it might actually change it might actually introduce a point C to your picture. In other words, it might become possible for you as somebody who works in a given community to live in a different community than you would have otherwise just because that train was there. In fact, over, over the sweep of decades, communities may come into existence just because a certain commuting option materialized, whether we're talking about a highway interchange uh, or a high-speed rail stop or something else. And so what we really got to think about is not just how we create a newer, maybe better, faster, cleaner, safer way to get from point A to point B, but how the points A, B, C, D, and E change when we make good choices about how infrastructure ought to work. That's the level of thinking we've got to invite ourselves to do, which is not always easy, given the, uh, as you mentioned, the world of annual appropriations and, and uh, immediate state of good repair concerns that are preoccupying a lot of the people who work on infrastructure for a living today. That's such a wonderful point, that, that introduction of, of point C and, and kind of the, the, the emergence of that, that third point, um, really also about um, the people changing even, um, who move between points A, B, and C. And, and a lot of the conversation we've had internally is around um, not just transportation, but mobility, mm -hmm. um, not just physical mobility, but social mobility. Um, and I can imagine as you're talking uh, and sharing that reflection that in a lot of ways, that point C could also be a reflection of how the people are evolving as well in terms of social mobility. Um, and we think about equity, as you mentioned early, oh. uh, earlier, um, accessibility and affordability. Um, Absolutely. Look, there's always been a deep connection between social and economic mobility. 
and physical mobility. It's part of why access to mobility is so important and it's often so politically contested, right? It's not an accident in my view that uh, one of the signal moments of the civil rights movement was uh, the, the bus boycott and, and uh, these struggles over who got equitable access to transportation, not just the dignified and equal use of transportation assets, but uh, often even whether people were served at all. And, uh, you know, frankly, you see the implications of mobility most dramatically when it is denied. Uh, when you see that living in a community that is a that can be a transit desert, for example, in the same way that we have food deserts, impacts the life choices and the economic opportunities of the people who are there. Transportation is empowering and access to transportation empowers people to uh, reach educational opportunity, economic opportunity, even social cohesion, the ability to, to gather with loved ones or participate in civic life. Um, these things are, are, are deeply, deeply connected. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's always a good idea to think about transportation as a form of freedom. Mm. Yeah, and there's so many, so many works of literature and art, uh, filmmaking that I think bring some of those images to life and really signal and communicate uh, what you're referring to um, and this idea and this connection between um, transportation, mobility, freedom at the other end. Um, I'd love to try something um, in, in, uh, as, as we move into kind of the the last few moments, um, maybe a couple questions, um, and do a little bit of a rapid fire round if you're up for it. All right, let's try it. Yeah. So in in in, in futures planning, we often do this. Uh, this kind of we're moving from to um, as a way of just framing very quickly um, what a evolution looks like and what a future scenarios look like um, to do the radical reimagining. Um, so um, if I give you a, a from as, a, as an example of today, um, uh, so the, the rapid fire would for, for you to just give us a forecast or a quick reaction to what would it look like in the future? Um, so one day in the future, this may be possible. It's not to say that we're actually working on it or that you're actually working on it, but just a way of projecting a possibility. Hmm. Um, sound good? All right, we'll give it a shot. All right, let's see. So from Mars to the stars, I guess. I mean, if the Mars is our current destination where we're mobilizing to try to go, uh, it's exciting to think about what the next leap might be. And that's uh, you know, not just getting around our solar system, but well beyond it. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll try another one. Um, <clears throat> thinking about cars and automotive. Um, so from a monthly car payment <laughs> to a monthly mobility dividend. Hmm. And what I mean by that is if we're looking way out into the future where we have things like, let's imagine distributed energy generation where you have resources at your house, whether it's a dramatically more efficient, uh, even solar panels and wind resources than we have today or something we can't even imagine. But just on your, you know, uh, from your home, you can put more into the transportation system than you get out of it through things like energy. So that you would participate in creating so much value, that you'd actually get a net dividend on it instead of paying into it on a net basis. Uh, now that's pretty far out. Uh, a, a more intermediate goal might be from a monthly car payment to uh, a, a monthly transportation payment that's quite a bit less than a car payment that covers everything. And we're actually seeing certain glimmers of this now. So some of the rideshare companies, for example, are starting to look at mobility as a service where uh, you have some kind of interface and it's neutral on whether you're on one of their bikes or in one of their rideshare things or just on public transit or some combination thereof, or it even leads to a train ticket or something where all you do is you tell your smartphone uh, you know, hey Siri, book me from from you know the street corner I'm standing at to uh, my cousin's house in Louisville, and then uh, Siri figures it out and uh, you, you pay once, and it may or may not be a single seat ride, but off you go. That's a vision I think that's uh, well within our lifetimes, if not within our grasp. Could that could that get us to the stars? 
for that monthly dividend get us to the star? Eventually. I don't see why not. I don't see why not either. All right, let's try one more. I think you actually, you, you mentioned it earlier uh, when we were talking about some works of fiction. Mm. Um, so from flying cars to flying... Mm. Um... Well, look, flying packages are around the corner. So we might start with those. And let's be careful with those. You, you don't want all the packages flying every which way. Um, but uh, those might well be on our horizon. Great. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for doing that one. We'll <laughs> think of some more. Um, I, I just want to uh, maybe wrap up with maybe one final question, um, which is really the future you. Hmm. I mean, not you, Pete Buttigieg. Um, so at New America, we, we think a lot about um, building the field uh, and we're committed to building the fields uh, that we work in, uh, the next generation of voices, the next generation of thinkers. Um, and we have many programs that do that work. Um, if you reflect uh, 50 years from now on the Secretary of Transportation, uh, so who'll be sitting in your seat, um, could you tell us who you imagine might be there? What set of skills would they need to have? What experiences would they have had by that point? Well, that's a, that's a fun one to think about. So if, if I envision 2072, uh, with some good fortune, I'll still be puttering around watching what the Secretary of Transportation is up to. And the truth is, this is a relatively young department. I should mention that it hasn't been around for 50 years. So we will not yet have reached the centennial, uh, or I guess it's right around 50 years, I should say, but uh, uh, it was cobbled together uh, uh, after the FAA and the Federal Highway Administration already existed. Um, I think some of the qualities will be the same. I think uh, you know she or he will need to be thinking about the effect that transportation on has on people's ability to live lives that they're choosing. Um, and that will be so different. But I, I hope the to-do list will be very different. Because in the 2070s, of course, we will have either succeeded or, uh, or failed on the climate challenge. And it'll be very, there'll be no escaping that we either pulled it off or we didn't. And uh, I try to veer away from the dystopian. So let's suppose that we did. Let's suppose that we here in the 2020s got it right with things like the, the widespread adoption of electric vehicles and the search for alternative sources of propulsion for the harder to decarbonize sectors like maritime and aviation. That means that uh, one of the big items on my to-do list, which is climate, will have more or less been dealt with uh, by the time uh, someone's doing that job in 50 years. Likewise, you know, right now we're trying to deal with profound inequities in American transportation. Uh, it, it would be, attractive to imagine that 50 years from now, that's, that's been done, that, that the generations now in charge mm -hmm. will have seen to that. So that there's very little question of whether you can equitably access mobility to get to where you need to be. Uh, but certain things that are on the to-do to list now will stay that way. Uh, the first, safety. Uh, who knows what things will be uh, regulating for safety right now, but uh, probably more automated vehicles, probably more uh, drone type delivery of goods, um, maybe jetpacks and flying cars and all that, all that fun stuff. We'll see. Uh, but certainly the idea of losing 40,000 people on our roadways as we do right now every year will be a grotesque and antiquated thought. Um, just as is, uh, you know, the idea today that, that, uh, people would routinely be lost to, to dysentery or something like that. That's another item that uh, we ought to take care of so that my successor in 50 years doesn't have to. Uh, but safety will still be top of mind. I think uh, uh, making sure that whatever technologies are around the corner then serve to benefit people uh, will still be top of mind. And, and I hope that a secretary who will have grown up, uh, perhaps in the generation of my uh, less than one-year-old children, uh, will see as uh, an environment of policy success. In other words, they will have seen the experience of our society deciding to collect revenue and then use it to deliver good results on everything from healthcare to transportation infrastructure. Use that to build confidence in the power of collective action to do good things. 
and balance the freedoms that are created by government getting out of the way with the freedoms that are created by government doing a good job and be able to bring that approach to whatever infrastructure needs there are in the future. But I'm doing my best to make sure this funding, which we may not get again for 50 years or so, and build things that are in good enough shape that uh, she or he won't, uh, uh, won't have to worry quite as much as we do uh, about them falling apart. That's a good that's a good forecast and a good foreshadowing of I think what we are hoping for, and I think gives us a good springboard into the rest of uh, how we'll spend the hour with some of the the writers that have joined us. Um, so, Mr. Secretary, we're going to let you go. I know uh, your time is precious. We so appreciate you joining us for this and really to to give us some things to think about um, in the future. And, and I love the point of twenty seventy two. It's maybe a, a way for us just to think about and do the work of imagining going forward. Uh, we so appreciate your time. Um, Likewise. We're, we're going to pass off to our, our, our colleagues at Future Tense. Thank you for joining us. And thanks Thank for you. imagining with us. We'll Great being with you. Thank you. Take care. So I am going to uh, now turn us uh, towards the second part of our uh, event today. Um, let me hand this off to Ed Finn. He is the founding director of the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University and the ac academic director of Future Tense. Ed, over to you. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, thank you for that fabulous conversation. And thank you to uh, Secretary Buttigieg as well. Uh, uh, really, really interesting and a beautiful setup, I think, for this conversation we're about to have. So the Center for Science and the Imagination has a mission of inspiring collective imagination for better futures. And Future Tense has been a, a, a collaboration of ours from the very beginning. We feel so lucky to be uh, representing ASU in this partnership with New America and with Slate. And it, Future Tense fiction is, has always been dear to my heart because I think it, it speaks to the heart of what we do and the conversation that we just heard, the way in which stories about the future can inspire real change in the present and can invite people to imagine in detail these different possibilities that might feel very abstract when you're talking about blueprints or you're talking about financial projections or you're talking about other kinds of uh, complex visions or estimates of the future that are, are not really accessible. And even the experts who work on those different kinds of uh, thought vehicles, you might call them for the future, often don't feel like they have access to the bigger picture. And so <clears throat> a good story can invite engineers and policymakers and, and members of the general public to all have a conversation together about what we're working towards and whether that those are things we really want. And maybe most importantly of all, uh, stories like the ones we publish in Future Tense Fiction allow us to feel what it might be like to live in this future, to recognize it not just on the plane of ideas or new technologies or policies, but actual people living their lives. And what is it going to feel like to wake up and, and get out there in the morning and, and live in this world? And is that a world that we want uh, to, to give to our children? Is that a world that we want to try to work towards today? So let me briefly introduce our three fabulous speakers today, and then I'm going to set them up with a, an opening question. <clears throat> uh, Annalie Newitz is a science fiction author, a contributor to the New York Times and New Scientist, and the co-host of the award-winning podcast, Our Opinions Are Correct, one of the great podcast titles. Their most recent book is Four Lost Cities, A Secret History of the Urban Age. Uh, Tochi Onyebuchi is an author of fiction and nonfiction uh, and a former civil rights lawyer. His most recent book is the novel Goliath, and his novel Riot Baby won the Ignite Award, World Fantasy Award, and New England Book Award. And Linda Nagata is an author of science fiction and fantasy based in Maui, Hawaii, with a background in zoology. Her fiction has won the Locus and Nebula Awards, and her most recent novel is the science fiction techno thriller Pacific Storm. So very excited to, to have you all joining us. Uh, hopefully you'll you'll be on turn on turn on your camera soon. Um, but uh, I want to just start with that comment that uh, Secretary Buttigieg made about the opening shots of science fiction stories, which I thought was uh, really astute. 
And I hadn't really thought about the fact that it's, he's, he's absolutely right. It, it always involves something moving around. That's how we know that we're somewhere, we're somewhere new. We're not in Kansas anymore or that Kansas has dramatically changed. And uh, I wanted to ask, as people who have done a lot of opening scenes for your stories and different science fictional worlds that you've imagined, how you think about that is, why, why do you think that transportation is so essential to our feeling of, you know, oh, things have changed? And, and is this something that you found yourself doing in a story that you've written? Um, I'm gonna, let's see, why, why don't we, we start with you, Tochi? Um, it's, I mean, it's interesting, it's funny. It's a, it's a point that I hadn't really thought of, which is particularly egregious given my filmic background. Um, but oftentimes I think of these opening shots in the context of the genre that I'm sort of playing around in, in addition to science fiction and fantasy. So Goliath, for instance, uh, particularly the beginning um, is a lot of commentary on the Western. And you know, the Western is somebody comes to town or somebody leaves town. And so we have that beginning of Jonathan coming from the space colonies into an irradiated New Haven. And it's about his journey and the things that he's sort of thinking of. And that's, you know, guy comes to town. And alternatively, How to Pay Reparations, a documentary, the story that I wrote for Future Tense, um, I wanted to play around in the heist genre a little bit. You know, you have this sort of motley crew of people coming together to pull off this you know, it sounds it sounds weird to call it a heist because it's like reparations and ultimately it's about like equity. If there's anything heist like about it, it's in a sort of Robin Hood fashion. Um, but yeah, you have you have these people sitting down talking about. Yeah. So, we you know, we had this we had this plan to like pay reparations, <laughs> um, launch this reparations plan in our town. And so it's interesting, like that's that's oftentimes uh, you know what I'm trying to do with opening scenes is sort of set a. a you know, get the reader in a posture of intrigue, so to speak. And I think it's really interesting that you you also tie it to genre and that there are uh, sort of, there's, there's a transportation genre link as well, which I, I hadn't really thought about. Uh, Emily, how about you? Yeah, I mean, it is interesting that we center vehicles so much in our fiction. Um, I, I also found that to be a really interesting point. Um, I find that um, it, it is embarrassing because I'm thinking about my novels and all of them do start with transit. Um, I am personally obsessed with transit, so that is not um, too surprising. Um, but I find that it's a good way to um, take readers through the world um, and when, when I was first working on my nonfiction book about cities, Four Lost Cities, I talked to a, um, an architect uh, who'd done a lot of urban planning. And one of the things that he said to me was, when you go to a new city, what you should do is get on the transit downtown, whatever transit, and just take it to the end of the line. And that will tell you everything you need to know about this city. Um, and I did that. Actually, the next city I went to after that was Istanbul. And I had an insane adventure on the train, um, which I found really valuable. And so it, and it showed me sort of social relations. It showed me different neighborhoods. It showed me how well the transit was maintained, which at that time was not super well. Um, and so when I started my novel Autonomous, um, which is set about 150 years in the future, um, my character is a pirate. Um, a pharmaceutical pirate, and she has a submarine that she is um, smuggling drugs in uh, across the Arctic Sea. And so that was easy, right? Because it allowed me to introduce the fact that the Arctic Sea is ice free. Um, it allowed me to introduce the kind of corporate entities in the world who are struggling over who gets to manufacture drugs and who gets to have those drugs. And so for me, it was kind of just this fun, sneaky way to be like, here you are in this particular future with these sorts of social relations and all of them kind of congeal around this vehicle, which has like a, a driver who has a particular goal and who kind of fits into these larger pictures. Um, and in the piece I wrote for Future Tense, um, when Robot and Crow saved East St. Louis, we start with a drone uh, who's in St. Louis proper in a wealthy neighborhood and then goes across the river to East St. Louis. <clears throat> and again, we immediately see um, the different kinds of social relationships in those areas. Um, and I think that's what's really great about thinking about transit through science fiction is, is that it lets you evoke 
um, all these different kinds of social institutions and how they affect infrastructure and transit, like economic stuff, uh, social stuff, um, a lot of the things that um, Secretary Buttigieg was talking about, um, about when we think about transit, we have to think about communities and how they change over time. So I think it's, um, it's a sneaky device that I didn't realize I was using. So, um, so that's quite, uh, quite interesting to be thinking about going forward. Oh, yes, a pirate she. Uh, this seems like a great transition, Linda, to your story, which of the three is probably the most explicitly about transportation. Uh, so how do you think about uh, th these questions in your work and if you found yourself doing some of these same moves? I find that the, the technology in the story, it, it tends to evolve. Um, when I'm trying to, to create a story, I always, I'm always keeping in mind that the future is not one thing, quote unquote. And so we need different elements to try to build that um, sense of, of possible reality. So the, the whole transit system that I was writing about in the story was actually evolved in my novel, Pacific Storm. And um, that was, again, it was, I don't want to call it window dressing, but it's kind of one of those cues that the, the story is not now. Um, recently, I had a project that I was working on where we were dealing with um, artificial intelligence. And um, there was a lot of information about what the status of the field is now. And what I found was that what the status of the field is now is n not quite where we are with science fiction. In other words, writing about it now felt like old science fiction. So you have to be able to push the, the idea ahead in time to make it feel like you actually are in the future. So um, with that transit system, I just came up with them. Um, um, it's an automated taxi system. So it's run by an AI and it's, it's try to, trying to optimize for efficiency. So the, the trick behind it is that it will assign, the AI will assign you to cars that you would ride share with other people who are bound in the same direction as you. And um, you don't necessarily know who they are. It does also offer kind of a, a I don't wanna say a class system, but a behavior system. So if you, you have a, a good social rating, you get to ride with um, people with good social ratings. If not, you get downgraded. And that's, um, so and you're kind of limited to who you meet unless something very strange starts to happen. Yeah, I love uh, your point about how it's easy to write science fiction about that, that's sort of outmoded compared to what's really happening in terms of infrastructure and transportation. I always think about the fact that the Jetson still looks like the future to us. It still feels like a Tomorrowland sort of future, and we're still talking about where are my flying cars, where are my jetpacks. You know, we never, we we still haven't gotten them. And uh, you make this wonderful point, and I think your story does a, a great job of of exploring the strangeness of how these tr real world transportation systems in the near future could be dramatically different from the 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 tropes that we've been working over in our in our stories for for decades now, and I want to connect this back to a, another comment that we we had in the, the earlier conversation with Secretary Buttigieg about the the interesting the long range planning. You know, you think about transportation and infrastructure is one of the few areas where governments really make these big long term bets on the future, big assumptions, and because it's the only way to do it, right? You have to make those decisions, and those decisions have huge consequences, uh, many of them surprising and unexpected. And you've all touched a little bit already on how you, you've thought about that in, or how that's played out in, in writing that you've done, uh, stories that you've created. But maybe you could talk a little bit more about what inspired uh, infrastructure, transit systems that you imagined, uh, or what research did you do? Um, I love, uh, Annalie, your idea of getting on the train and riding it all the way out. I, I want to hear about your Istanbul adventure sometime. but. A different time, probably. Uh, and what's maybe what surprised you about how these uh, how these things rolled out, or how they influenced your story uh, in thinking about that notion of the the intersection of infrastructure and different kinds of social relationships? Uh, I don't know if anyone would like to go first for this one. I just wanted to say that 
I feel like um, we've had this kind of consensus future in science fiction. So like back in the days of the Jetsons, it was the whole flying cars thing. And then it just evolved as time goes by. Um, so much of science fiction is a conversation between writers, but also between the evolving reality. And so right now it's, it's all autonomous cars and um, AI driven mechanisms of transportation. So, I mean, that of course was a huge influence on, on a lot of the work that I've done recently. Um, I think trying to extrapolate the implications, what are the things, how would it really work and, and what are the things that could go wrong and um, what are some of the unexpected fallouts of these new systems? Those are the kind of questions that, you know, I'm thinking about when I try to write these stories. Yeah, it's with regards to social relations, I, I distinctly remember it must have been maybe four years back or so. Um, there was a rail extension from New Haven to Hartford, uh, the CT rail extension. So, you know, if you were, you know, we had Metro North to get you between New Haven and, and Grand Central. Uh, and this extension uh, basically made it a lot easier and a lot cheaper to get from New Haven to all the way to Springfield with various stops in between. And, you know, my family lives in the Hartford area. And before then, even though I lived in New Haven, um, you know, if I was without a car, I had to depend on very sporadic Amtrak times to go home. The CT rail operated like almost depending on the day, every single hour. And so the ease with which I was able to go home and see my mom um, increased greatly. And I found that my, my life and my quality of life improved drastically as a result of increased access to home cooked meals. Um, but, you know, I think that's, you know, when we talk about, you know, particularly uh, the effects on social relations with regards to technological innovations or technological improvement, um, particularly in the realm of transportation, that's something that always comes to mind. I have greater access to my family because of this rail extension. Um, and another thing that the previous conversation made me think of was that when we think of transportation, it's not just about people, it's the transport of goods. Um, and, the, you know, in the beginning, I was wondering, hmm, how does my reparation story tie into this issue of transportation, right? Um, but there's a whole dispersal element of it. It's not just the calculation of an amount that you would send to individual citizens residing in your metropole. How do you get that money to these people? And one of the side effects of the whole plan to pay reparations is that, you know, because it's sort of zoned, you know, with this complicated algorithm involving zip codes and whatnot, a lot of it is based on where people live. And all of a sudden, when people are able to afford to live somewhere else, that changes and they go live somewhere else where they have access to a different school system or what have you. Um, and that has all sorts of domino effects because then you have to bring into account the changing social landscape of your city. And if you've calculated this, this sort of attempt at equity based on where people live in a very sort of static way, that like it, all these different things are sort of implicated. And so I was very, you know, it's, it's very interesting to think about future impacts with regards to these sorts of things. I think the point about introducing a point C, um, you know, as a consequence of your work in improving transit between point A and point B is very well taken in that regard. I think this is um, such an interesting question because, uh, so I, I'm going to talk about a novel that I have that's coming out in a few months. Um, so I'm afraid that you can't actually read it to um, verify what I'm saying is true. Um, it's called The Terraformers and it's about some terraformers. And um, the main uh, action of the book is that they're trying to create transit <clears throat> for this planet that they're building. So they, and there's a bunch of different groups who are, you know, obviously fighting over how this is going to work. And so I knew that I had to create transit. One of my biggest questions was exactly what Tochi was bringing up about how do you create infrastructure that doesn't kind of 
decay socially so that you don't assume you're always going to have the same configuration of settlements and um, and the same kinds of commutes. So I actually um, luckily was able to talk to Jeffrey Tumlin, who is our director of transit at the San Francisco uh, Municipal Transit Authority. And he is a huge science fiction fan, so he was willing to spend a long time talking to me about the questions that I had, which were things like um, who typically owns transit if you're building transit across a planet okay we're not just talking about between cities and he was bringing up all this stuff that i didn't even know like for example oftentimes you do have one group that owns the train up to the edge of a city and then another group that owns it in the city and how do they match up um, i was also really interested in how you figure out where to put stations. Um, I play the game Mini Metro. So if you've ever wanted to <laughs> build, uh, drive yourself crazy building uh, train stations, it's just a casual game on your phone and you kind of put stations in and people get angry if the stations aren't in the right place and stuff like that. So um, one of the things that Jeffrey said to me was, um, because I wanted to have flying transit. And he was like, well, people hate it when things fly over the city. So if you're going to have flying transit, it has to go under the city, um, you know, as you as as you come in. Um, but I ended up um, after talking to him for a while and thinking about it, I came up with flying trains um, because then you don't you're not tied to a track infrastructure. Uh, it's also less environmentally impactful. My characters go around and do things like take environmental samples. There's a whole section of the book where all they're doing is surveying people in the city about where they want to go, uh, because that's the kind of exciting science fiction I write. <laughs> um, and you know, you're just surveying people in the town about commuting to downtown areas. Um, so the flying trains are also artificially intelligent and they form their own government um, eventually. And so um, it becomes this interesting question about how does transit as a social force interact with the communities on the planet? Um, and it's uh, it, it really became, um, you know, an exercise in thinking about I want to say nation building, although they're not really building nations, it's far in the future. Um, and so I won't give spoilers, but basically, yeah, the way that I came up with a form of transit that would be sustainable and um, and sort of able to to shift to meet new um, future configurations of, of human settlement was create sentient flying trains um, and then, you know, let the train um, fall in love with someone, because I guess that's what happens in the future. So. <clears throat> <laughs> I love the idea of a, of a Congress of trains or a collective of trains. Uh, that's really beautiful. And your comments about the, the flying vehicles, you've given me another little epiphany that I'm sure would be really obvious to someone in the transportation world, which is that one of the reasons we must, we like the idea of flying cars or flying trains is that we're trying to have our cake and eat it too. We're trying to have this beautiful, you know, rapid transit system without all of the stuff and the built infrastructure and filling up our streets and our skies with, you know, I don't know, pl platforms and tracks and stuff. And so the future is a place where you can, you have all that perfect mobility, but you don't have to deal with the logistics and the sunk costs of, of making that stuff possible. So that, which that brings me to another thing I want to bring up, uh, and you got me thinking about this, Tochi, talking about the, the transformation of your of, of your own time through through this new rail line that opened and some advice that when my wife graduated from law school was the the, the centerpiece the first big piece of advice that the, the graduation speaker had which was consider the commute consider the commute for the rest of your life and that could be a really important factor in your overall happiness and how everything else plays out and it's really good advice you know that we 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 spend so much time, getting around and often we don't we don't re recognize how much of an investment not just in times in terms of time but emotional labor and stress and all the other things physical work sometimes involved in commuting and so this got me thinking that uh the the role of transportation is really just as much about time as it is about space and giving people these different opportunities so, okay, now my pivot, speaking of time, I wanna talk about the, the, the future and this, this idea of science fiction, storytelling, future visions in relation to actual public policy. 
how do you think science fictional visions of the future can be helpful in thinking through potential policy interventions? Uh, and then on the other hand, what are some of the hazards in trying to tie fiction and reality together like this? Um. I think it, it, you know, it's helpful because it's thought experiments. It's, it's a cheap way to make mistakes. Um, it, you can explore different ideas, different implications. Um, like you know, my taxi story was an example because I was very surprised that several people seemed to think this idea of being assigned to a taxi was some kind of terrible imposition. Um, I did not expect that. <laughs> So, you know, there's ways of finding, it, it's a way of just kind of far off experimenting and seeing how people react to new ideas. Um, dangers of tying it to, maybe is, the danger is that we think things will be easy. It's, it's fairly, fairly easy to write a story, very hard to build a new train system. So I think it, it's just a good way to kind of and confront these ideas. I'll I'll just I'll I'll jump in too just to piggyback off of some of what Linda was saying. I mean I think I think what's I think what's interesting is that sometimes the the downside is that science fiction um, can be looked at as some sort of predictive tool right or oh this is what it's going to be like in the future or what have you or this is you know uh, there'll be an evil company in a science fiction novel and the lesson will be okay don't name your company after this evil company like this company is evil don't do this don't be evil and then some you know lex some real life lex Luthor, minus the charm um will have read that novel and been like, oh, that was a really cool company. I'm going to name my company after the evil company. And it's like, come on, guy, like, come, come on, really? Um, but I do think there was a very interesting phrase that I heard at the very beginning of this event when Mr. Butler was talking about the preface to the Future Tense anthology, and that was um, dress rehearsal. Um, and that's very much the spirit in which I thought of my reparation story. I was like, okay, this is a super fantastical idea. Uh, there's no way that this would happen in real life, but what if, right? Like, what if, what if a city, you know, what if a portion of city leadership decided to take seriously the issue of reparations? What might that look like? How might we go about that? Um, what are the, you know, both the political implications, but how do you try to get, how do you anticipate and try to get around, you know, what you might, you know, what you might conceive of as some of the political obstacles to that? How would you think about disbursement? How would you think about where the money would go, you know, versus, you know, individuals versus institutions? Like, would you send it to schools? Would you send it to, you know, the heads of school districts? Would you send it to individuals living in those school districts? Like, it's, it was really, it was really interesting to think through those questions with regards to something that could conceivably happen tomorrow. You know, there could be somebody in, in a state legislature somewhere who is at work right now on like not a bill but even just in conversation with others about okay this is something that maybe we should think about like I think it was maybe a little after the story came out there was in the news oh I wish I could I, I'm blanking on the details I feel like it was somewhere in the Midwest but there was a town that was like okay we're going to seriously contemplate a reparation scheme and I was like wait a second that, like, <laughs> I you know it, it was supposed to be a bit farther out like you know this thing actually happening but I don't know I think dress rehearsal is an interesting a, a very interesting way to think about the ways in which science fiction can you know, adjust or inform our thinking on these issues. Yeah, actually, um, California has a, a state reparations task force that is um, getting going. They're having conversations. We'll see if anybody gets any money, um, but that would be nice. Um, 
one of the I think one of the dangers of um, using science fiction to think about the future is that sometimes when a story is really great, like say a story of a flying car, um, we get kind of like calcified around that story. And it almost holds us back. Um, I think Linda was saying that, you know, flying cars were kind of a, a previous vision of the future and now we're thinking about autonomous cars. Um, but I think I still hear people say to me, where's my flying car? And I'm like, you know, what about like the fact that you have um, video phones everywhere now? Like, aren't you excited about that? Or like, also, don't you want something other than a car? Like what, you know, but we, we're still kind of stuck in that what what people often call a retro future. Um, and so I think um, that's why it's really important that we continue to um, read science fiction that's contemporary and that we keep focusing on, you know, kind of new writing and new storytelling, um, including video games and things like that. Um, I think the good thing about um, using science fiction to think about the future is, um, you know, when we do kind of public policy planning, I think one of the big hurdles is taking like the a, a, like looking at sort of second order effects, often that's just out of scope of your project. You know, you're not looking at like, well, how might a community be affected in 50 years? Um, and I think like um, uh, for folks who watched the new Dune movie or who read Dune or who are familiar with the Dune-iverse, um, that's a really interesting story about transit because it looks not just at like the super beautiful spaceships, especially in the new film, um, but also at uh, propulsion systems and the the energy, the fuel that we use to to do all of our fancy space travel, the kinds of um, groups that are formed, the kinds of government organizations that are formed around transit. There's a whole guild of spacers who've like physically altered their bodies to be able to um, to propel spaceships. And so that's the kind of second order effect that I think is really interesting that science fiction gives us is like, look, you get a whole economy around this new form of transit and a whole new form of colonialism, a whole new form of um, oppression and reparations that will be needed. Um, in fact, you could even argue that in some sense, Dune is a little bit about environmental reparations. You know, it's about demanding that, um, that uh, you know, I don't know, Harkonnens off Dune or whatever, <laughs> Harkonnens get off of Arrakis, um, everybody off of Arrakis, is, which is, that's the planet where the energy comes from. Anyway, so yeah, I think, I think that's um, incredibly valuable, as long as you don't get stuck with one vision of the future. I'm here for all of the Dune equity and justice conversations, and that is a beautiful setup to how does this play out in other narratives around the future? How can science fiction help us address accessibility? How can this help? How can stories about these possible futures address the needs of people today with disabilities or who might be in other ways excluded or disadvantaged by current systems? Um, I mean, I, I might jump in with a kind of a, a mushy gushy answer. Um, last year, I, I and um, another uh, fantastic writer, Madeline Ashby, we had the opportunity to collaborate with the Smithsonian um, through, you know, ASU's incredible and, and very sort of dynamic uh, CSI uh, on, their, on their futures exhibit. And so this was uh, an opportunity to, you know, on this occasion of the anniversary of the Smithsonian, imagine what, you know, what various aspects of life might be like you know, set far, far, far into the future. And Madeline and I would write our stories. Um, Brian Miller was the design artist who, who crafted the posters that were part of the exhibit and that coincided with each of our stories. Um, and prior to all of that, we would all um, participate in different workshops with various research institutes affiliated with the Smithsonian or that were part of the Smithsonian. These covered everything from you know, uh, you know, issues of accessibility to African American history in the United States, to uh, bioconservation, to you know, the history of women in the sciences, all sorts of things. And one of the 
one of perhaps the greatest effects that I had with regards to those workshops was that all the stories that I ended up writing had an optimistic bent to them. And anybody familiar with my work knows that optimism, you don't come to my work for a sense of, you know, for a sense of optimism. Um, it's, uh, you know, if there, if there is, you know, any sense of hope that you might leave my work with, it's a very sort of charred and uh, eviscerated, like the type of hope that's, that's born of like bare survival um, or barely surviving an experience. Um, but the stories that I ended up writing for, for the Futures exhibit were incredibly optimistic. And I think a lot of that was just osmosis with regards to the workshops and the, the people in these research institutes doing all sorts of incredible and fantastic work. Um, and it never seemed to them at least from the tenor of our discussions, like they ever felt that they were Sisyphus pushing the boulder uphill. They delighted in their work and they, and they saw they could see success or at least what success looked like. And it was something for them to advance towards. And for so many of these issues, it'd be very easy to take a very sort of dystopian cast to them. Um, environmental preservation for one. Uh, but it was just so inspiring <laughs> being around these people and it couldn't help but infect my fiction. And so I think that's, that's one of the helpful things that, you know, science fiction, particularly with regards to our imaginings of, of the future can do for us is that they can inspire optimism. I think, you know, looking at the current state of affairs, it can be very difficult to be optimistic about things. Looking back at the historical record, it can be incredibly difficult to be optimistic about things. But the future isn't written yet. And I think if we can look at visions of the future and have that inspire a sense of optimism about our present, that can be incredibly helpful. So sorry, that's like not a very sort of tactile answer, but it's something that's been on my mind a lot lately. Thank you, because I'm at an age where I'm, I'm really over the dystopia. <laughs> I would like to, to still to try to imagine that we do have a shot at a, at a decent future. Um, I think as far as the, the disabilities question, I, I just wanted to point out how um, Tochi, your story and Annalise's story and in and mine also all seem to depend on the government or some kind of um, corporation or something knowing the people that they're dealing with and knowing very well who they are, what they do, and what they need. And it just it seems to me that that kind of a system, while it can be scary to think about, but we are also all of us are now already participating in that sort of a system. Um, but that could, in a sense, address the needs of people who have different needs, who have disabilities, who, who might need a, a, a different form of transportation than other people would. And it would also allow a lot of variety in the system. So you know, maybe we do have some things to look forward to. <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, I totally agree with what both Tochi and Linda are saying. And I, I think in my story that I did for Future Tense, which is about the drone that is, um, it's a healthcare drone uh, and it's, it's designed to do health surveillance. So it goes to different places um, in the greater St. Louis area, um, just taking people's temperatures and having them like cough into a, a Kleenex. Um, and the CDC is defunded. Uh, it's a CDC drone, um, and it's just now it's kind of a drift. But luckily, um, the woman who programmed this drone um, programmed the drone to um, kind of go off the beaten track and visit neighborhoods um, that it's not supposed to. It's really only supposed to go to the wealthy neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, but she's from we never know this in the story, but in my head, <laughs> this character has familiarity with um, shall we say, non-elite areas. And so 
um, the drone, when it no longer has orders from the CDC, keeps going around in these um, parts of East St. Louis where it's they're basically uh, you know unhoused people who are squatting in buildings, um, and and it discovers an outbreak um, and is able to work with kind of a nonprofit to um, get a vaccine out. Um, the drone also um, works with. Uh, a local gang of crows because the drone figures out how to communicate um, th with the crows by like gradually building up a big enough data set um, of, of crow words. This is very unrealistic, by the way. <laughs> when the story came out in Slate, um, a, an AI expert wrote a, an essay alongside it um, talking about how, well, this is fairy tale machine learning, but maybe in the future this would happen. And um, my idea was that um, as I was writing it, it was kind of a fairy tale in my mind, but it was about trying to imagine how um, underserved communities, marginalized groups that desperately need health care, like what would it take to get that to them, like to bring the health care to them? So the drone has to, first of all, have been programmed by someone who's sympathetic to those communities. Um, it also has to make an unusual alliance Obviously, an, an alliance with crows is extremely unusual, uh, but it's kind of symbolic of the um, of what we were talking about at the top with um, with Secretary Buttigieg about how you have to have these horizontal relationships between groups and often groups that you just wouldn't expect. Um, and so I think that that uh, in science fiction, it allows us to rethink who our allies are. Um, and what it really looks like to bring access and how a big part of access is just knowing communities um, and knowing what they need and, and physically where they are, what kinds of languages and sociolects they speak. Um, that's another big fantasy in the story is that the drone can speak like every sociolect in East St. Louis. Um, so people are willing to talk to the drone because uh, it's very cute and, and speaks Kind of their language and so um anyway yeah i think optimism comes out of all of this and it is very important because if we don't have optimism especially right now um you know we're we're doomed <laughs> so <laughs> we have to we have to like think about how we're gonna rebuild instead of how we're gonna um you know hang out in the smoking ruins we don't want you to write a book called more lost cities um so I completely agree and I love, thank you Tochi for those lovely comments about uh, the Smithsonian project and uh, Annalie, what you were saying uh, and, and Linda about the practice of hope, the way in which we, we have, I think a, a kind of moral obligation to, to think about what we, what, how we can make the world better, how we can make the future better, uh, even though sometimes it can be really hard and hope is also, it's the most powerful and sometimes the most dangerous thing that humans can do, right? Because hope uh, uh, is one of the, is, it, it's one of the, the children of imagination. It's the way that we do impossible things and not all the impossible things we do are, are always good, uh, but, uh, but it's very powerful. And I think we need to practice, you know, we need to get better and getting back to that idea of the dress rehearsal. I think it's, really important to build our collective imagine, uh, capacity for imagination or collective capacity for hope. And one of the best ways to do that is, is to think about history. You know, and all of your stories reflect on and build on history, getting back to Tochi's comments as well. So, and I was really struck by uh, the secretary's comments about thinking about infrastructure history and all these, so America, you know, in the grand scheme of things is not that old as, as a country, at least in its modern incarnation. And some of the oldest stuff we have is this infrastructure. You know, the, the, I didn't know those tunnels uh, were 149 years old. That's, that's really old. Uh, and so what lessons can we take from the history of infrastructure, transit, the built environment, and, uh, and think of the, that in the context of this, the, this, this, the notion of ideals, uh, thing, ideals to work towards or things to avoid. Just another really easy question for you. <laughs> I don't know. When it, whenever transportation infrastructure is mentioned, first, I live in Hawaii. I've lived here for almost all my life. I live on Maui, which is not Honolulu, let's say. It's, it's, it's a, it tends to be a rural island. 
I think we finally got a bus service of 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so when I go to the mainland, the thing that strikes me because we drive a lot is um, the interstate system. I mean, to me, that is one of the wonders of the world. The idea that you can get on this road and just go almost anywhere in the entire country. Um, that's kind of the, the scale of transportation infrastructure that I just find fascinating. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, I'm not gonna pretend to know a lot about this because this is a Honolulu problem. But Honolulu has been trying to build a rail system for probably the last 15 to 20 years, if not longer, and it still is not running, and it's way over the initial budget, and it's made a lot of people really unhappy over the years. So that kind of infrastructure thinking is just so important to where we're going. And But there's also the thing that you know, a lot of people live in cities and, and they have problems and they have the potential for a lot of solutions because it's shared among a lot of people. But um, like people like me, I live half an hour outside of town. My transportation options are gonna be limited. There's, we do have a bus service, like I said, but from where I live, I'd still have to travel about five miles to get to the first uh, the available bus stop. So it, it, it's interesting about you know, what is possible where and when. And then if you start thinking about um, global warming and what we, what kind of transportation systems we would need so that we're no longer pumping carbon into the air, you know, things begin to change again. Um, airships are very popular in science fiction. Uh, slow going um, zeppelins or whatever. And everybody loves the idea, and it is, it's a beautiful idea to have this, this quiet ship, solar powered, crossing the oceans. At the same time, who's got time to spend weeks in travel? It would be like going back to the Victorian era where um, only the wealthy who could take off for, say, the whole summer might be able to use a system like this. Or you can, you can consider it's not just one thing that changes, right? Maybe the whole society would have to evolve so that we have a completely different kind of work-life balance that would make this sort of system work. So it's questions like that, that, that I find really interesting. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I... I, I love your your point about the airship and how people would never be able to take the summer off to like float across the world. Because as, as you were describing, I was like, yes, of course, it sounds lovely. Um, I think what would realistically happen is, you know, you would just have Zoom meetings on the Zeppelin all day or something like that while you were working, which doesn't sound very nice or carbon neutral. Um, one of the transit histories that haunts me because I, I grew up in Southern California and my family, um, my immediate family was from Los Angeles, um, is that uh, in the early days of Los Angeles, um, it had this incredible cable car system, just like San Francisco used to have. Um, and if you watch like old silent movies, like the famous movie um, with Harold Lloyd from like 19 early 1920s, it's called Safety Last. It has that picture that everyone sees from the silent era of Harold Lloyd like hanging off of a clock going like, ah! Um, and he's wearing the little round glasses kind of like mine. Um, that movie is set kind of in the streets of LA and it's full of these cable cars and they're like part of the sight gags and he's kind of running around on the cable cars. And when you watch that film, you can see how completely cable cars dominated the Los Angeles transit infrastructure. Now, if you go to Los Angeles today, which is like, it's just this dystopia of cars. Um, everything is uh, gridlock. Um, if you're trying to get across the city, you know, it would take 10 minutes if you had a flying train um, or even an underground train. Um, and it, would, it takes you like an hour in a car. So it's, it's just horrifying. Um, and that infrastructure that was in place in 1923 when Harold Lloyd made that film, um, completely transformed in a matter of like 20 years. So 
to me, what that says is that it is incredibly easy if you have the money, um, the corporate interests in this case to to change the infrastructure like it, it, infrastructure can radically change in like a generation or even half of a generation, depending on how you count generations. Um, so that is hopeful. Um, but I think it is also, as we look to the future, something that is a huge glaring warning sign because uh, it is so easy for um, someone who has a lot of money to come in and just essentially wreck the future for many generations. Um, and, you know, we live in an era right now of kind of transit robber barons um, who, you know, kind of want to own, um, you know, the vehicle space and the communication space and like kind of create, um, I don't know if there's synergy there or something, whatever the the ugly word for synergy is. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, um, I think it, it's just a reminder that as we think about future transit, we have to think about who owns it and think about who runs it and manages it and whose interests are re reflected. And so um, I, I always, as I'm imagining future transit, I'm always trying to imagine these future transit groups, like future um, department of transit, um, in order to protect, um, you know, our settlement spaces where people live to protect people's access, um, to protect uh, people's, or to protect the environment as well, you know, because a lot of these corporate interests are not necessarily um, the same as, um, you know, what say environmental scientists might recommend. So, um, so yeah, I always just say to myself, remember the cable cars that are no longer here. <laughs> um, and, and let's try to not let that happen again. Yeah, uh, speaking of dystopia of cars, um, I part of the research of Goliath entailed looking a lot into uh, Robert Moses. Um, basically, if there's a single person who is most responsible for the dystopia that is getting around in New York, New York City, New York State, um, Long Island, it is that man. Um, and what was fascinating about that was that it, like that really rammed home the point that it is possible for a single person to completely reshape a metropole. Um, and not simply by, oh, being insulated from politics, but by literally co-opting the entire political apparatus. And he started out as a parks guy. Like that, like he's known for the highways and basically like, you know, demolishing entire neighborhoods for the sake of making it so a car could get from one place to another more easily. Um, but he, his, his mandate in the very beginning was, okay, I want this part of the city to look pretty. And I want this other part of the city to look pretty. And I don't really care about, you know, part C over there, so they don't get a park. And it, it was just, it was wild watching watching his, I don't even want to say evolution, because I don't think he changed. I think he just accrued more and more power and figured out like how to make it happen. There was one point he had over like 10 different titles. He was commissioner of this, head of that. And that made me think a lot about, about Annalise point, particularly during the course of their research, um, thinking about who, what, transit authority was responsible for what or who owned what and like it's and you know you think about metro north and because it crosses state lines you're like okay is it like a new york thing is it a connecticut thing is it both is do they get like territorial about it like what's what's the deal going on there and i mean it's 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 fascinating to look at the counterfactual with regards to new york if a fraction of the money that went into creating the traffic jams, the traffic apocalypse that is New York, you know, went into public transit, went into buses, went into the subway system, because there were moments of opportunity where that could have happened.
where you know there could have been a more robust um public transit system but no it just got sh it, it just got shunted because this guy was like cars are the cars are my favorite mode of transportation and that's all that matters to me and so i'm going to make it so that that's the supreme mode of getting around in this city and it was like all him it's wild because you're like no there had to have been it had to have been a group or he had to have answered to somebody or no he he was he was the answered to guy like he, like he just him it was just him and you know i'm i i'm going back to to annalise point about the sort of you know the flip side of it all in in being that the you know the swiftness with which a place can be remade can be heartening in and of itself because that means that the problems that we have now can be fixed and we don't have to wait two generations for that to happen the other side of it is that oftentimes the the people the institutions that do accrue the power to make those decisions and to make them with the type of speed that is often required for generational change do not often have the best interests of other other people um, at heart or often there is a financial impellent that is the supreme motivation um, governing their decisions and i don't know it was just like it was just really it was interesting doing that research and interesting is maybe the most like sanitized word that i could have applied to my learning about uh, the the dude who was robert moses uh, I want to bring in at least one or two questions from our audience here. So let's try to maybe give uh, brief answers or maybe even just have one person, uh, one, one brave volunteer answer, answer these. But this is a great question from Ken. What will be the biggest unintended consequence, good or bad, of our future transportation world? He gives an example of Bitcoin miners resuscitating coal, coal factories and coal mines. That's a pretty big one. <laughs> Boy. Anyone want to take a shot, Annalie? Sure. Um, so, I mean, it's going to depend on the kind of transit, right? So um, I think there's a couple unintended consequences that we have to think about. One is um, if you have a form of transit that is not changeable, like if it's on a track system or it's on a, you know, some kind of skyway or something like that, um, how does that change the neighborhoods around it? We've sort of been discussing that already, but there's a tendency for um, neighborhoods to become much more expensive around train stations. So that can always be an unintended consequence um, is creating new uh, marginal and neglected communities at the same time that you're creating these nice transit hubs. Um, the other thing is like, we never, whenever we think about like transporters on Star Trek, just to get very futuristic, no one ever talks about like whether they create pollution, whether there's some kind of toxic runoff. We do know that the warp drive does, is creating a bunch of toxins. Um, we learned that in, in, in the documentary, Star Trek, The Next Generation. Um, so, and we also never know who has access to transporters. Is it only the Federation? Do you have to be a Federation officer? Um, I'm curious. I'd like to know. I think those are the unintended consequences we always have to think about is what gets calcified around the transit and who has access. Yeah, that's a great response. One more qu quick question here from Felix. Do you believe there will be a future where physical mobility will be reduced to a minimum due to the advancement of technology, uh, other technologies like uh, 3D, 4D printers, the metaverse? That, I mean, part of that depends on, you know, bosses not being so um, insistent on us coming back to the office. Uh, you know, I guess it's it's on them. <laughs> <laughs> right. And again, another example of how all of these things are really tied together. Um, you know, we keep re we keep discovering new uh, ways of doing the old stuff, you know, like like the whole. Uh, gig economy rideshare thing is, is, as the secretary was saying, just this software layer on top of infrastructure and the idea of the personal vehicle that's been around for, for many decades. Um, I, th there's so many more questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them. Thank you uh, to our audience. I'm going to turn things over in a minute to uh, Paul Butler again, and I just want to say thank you so much 
uh, Annalie, Linda, Tochi, wonderful to see you again. Really appreciate your time today. Back over to you, Paul. Thanks, Ed. This was a, an amazing conversation. Uh, I have the I have the job of, of trying to close us out and maybe see what emerged in terms of the conversation and patterns. But I think there were some. There, there are three that really stuck with me as I, as I listened to all of you in conversation. Um, first is the importance of getting into the world of possibilities. Uh, Linda, you said the future is not just one thing. Uh, which really is something that I'm going to hold on to. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg talked about, as we've said here, um, not just point A and point B, but the possibilities of point C um, for new communities and mobility, the importance of equity and connection to that. Um, Linda, even your reflections about Maui, uh, just raising more expansive questions and possibilities about the where and the when. Um, and you also said in your description about the, the AI taxi system, um, just not building a consensus future um, and really pushing us to think beyond the now. Uh, and, and even Tochi, your, your point you made early on, uh, getting into a posture of intrigue. Um, so I think those are some really important kind of um, reflections, I think, and something to maybe all, for all of us to stay with the second big territory that really lingers with me and which I'll take away is transit as a social force. Uh, Annalie, uh, you have to tell us about your new book uh, and, and please share it when, when it's ready for us. But we talked here about the real effect um, of transportation on relationships and human connectivity. And Tochi, your, your, your story about the new rail in Hartford really gave that, I think, an important dimension. Um, but Annalie, you also, you really, you really cautioned us to think about decay uh, and making sure that transportation doesn't replicate the decay. Uh, so I think that's, a, that's an important takeaway for us to sit with. And Ed, you put it all together with your question about how to connect science fiction and, and public policy and making sure that connection is real. Um, this is a chief way to test. That's what we said in this conversation, to ask the question about what if, uh, Tochi nodding to your work on reparations, the hard questions can be tackled through this art form. Um, and the ability to make mistakes, Linda, is something that you said with this art form. Um, Annalie, you, you, you stress the importance of allies, uh, that this work can really uncover a new view about allies, um, but also a critical lens about ownership um, and deepening our understanding about access. Um, those I think are important takeaways. Um, and, and the importance of stories, uh, but the power of images, uh, I think was something that really stuck with me um, because images and stories can be so powerful. Annalie, you cautioned us not to get stuck in a calcified uh, retro future. Um, and I think that's an important caution as we think about this connection between science fiction and public policy. Um, but I love the spirit of optimism that we all had here um, and the importance of using this uh, art form and this discipline, really. Um, as I listen to all of you talk about uh, the specifics of your work. Um, this really is a discipline, um, but a space for, as Ed, you said, a practice of hope. So I think that idea of continuing to stay in this space of hope and continuously generating new may be the best place for us to end. Uh, so I just wanna thank everybody for joining. Um, thank Secretary Buttigieg again and the teams at Future Tense, ASU, Slate, New America, Tochi, Annalie, Linda, Ed, thank you again. And thanks to everybody who joined us for this conversation. Hopefully you all took something from it and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks.